The human rights-based approach to development looks at structural cause of inequality. How can this help women living in poverty? When I first read this statement, I was fascinated by it, mostly because I had no idea what it meant. Poverty, well, that is lack of money, isn't it? When I investigated this a bit more, I found out that poverty is much more than lack of money. Human poverty is more than income poverty. It is the denial of choices and opportunities for living a tolerable life. This definition of poverty is taken from a United Nations Development Programme document, which was drawn up in 1997. Here in Ireland, when our parents or teachers ask us what we would like to do when we grow up, we tell them of our dreams of college, traveling the world and exciting careers. Women in developing countries do not have such ambitious dreams. We want to choose our husband. We want to own land. We want to go to school. We don't want to be cut anymore. We want respect in politics, to be leaders. We want to be equal. This is a quote from Rebecca Lawasali, who helped establish a safe village for women in Kenya after she was beaten for speaking up for victims of rape. I was struck by the simplicity of her demands. These are all such basic human rights and ones we here in Ireland never even have to consider. Next, I looked at structural cause of inequality. I'd always assumed that poverty, and in particular inequality towards women, was caused by natural disasters, the culture of these countries, and very bad luck. By changing the culture of these countries, we could help these women. But the more I read about this problem, the more alarmed I became, as I learned that much of the poverty amongst women in developing countries is actually caused by the actions, actions of wealthier countries. Everything I believed came crashing down around me. I'd heard criticism of third world debt, but still believed that loans given to developing countries helped them to become financially independent. In fact, the opposite is true. The conditions imposed on these countries are actually increasing the divide between the rich and the poor, and these strict conditions are particularly damaging to the weakest members of society, women. Finally, I examine the phrase, human rights-based approach. Surely these lending institutions' main priorities are human rights. Isn't their main aim to alleviate suffering? In fact, when the World Bank and the IMF provide loans to developing countries, their main concern is that the loans will be repaid. They demand that these poor countries spend less on health, education and social welfare. Poor countries must export more raw materials in order to raise enough money to pay off their debts. The raw materials are then processed and exported back to the poor countries at a higher price. This creates a vicious cycle as the poorer countries struggle to keep up with debt repayment. They export goods for a cheaper price, reduce wages and working conditions for their workers, and spend less on health and education. The IMF and the World Bank are forcing developing countries to compete against much stronger and wealthier nations. In her book, A Fate Worse Than Debt, Susan George demonstrates how the policies of these banks are actually increasing the divide between the rich and the poor. Consumers in the Western world are delighted to have access to cheap products, but, but developing countries gain less and less profit. I believe that these debts are a major structural cause of poverty and are particularly harmful in the lives of women. In many countries, although women prepare all meals, they are only allowed to eat after the males in the family. Therefore, when there is a shortage of food, they are often left hungry. In 2002, a debt campaign organisation found that the IMF forced the Malawi government to sell surplus grain in favour of foreign exchange just before a famine struck. This was to ensure that debts could be repaid. This, deci this decision imposed on the Malawi government resulted in 7 million people being severely short of food. 
Our reduction in spending on healthcare has a particularly devastating effect on the lives of women. More than 140 million women worldwide have insufficient access to family planning. This means they often have large families and it increases the risk of maternal and child mortality. Anne-Louise Cogan writes in Hazardous to Health, the World Bank and the IMF in Africa. The policies of these institutions have caused a deterioration in health and in healthcare services across the African continent. When developing countries are forced to reduce their spending on education, it is women and girls who suffer the most. If a family cannot afford to send all their children to school, they will keep their daughters at home, as they consider the education of males to be more important. This clearly places the young women at a disadvantage for the remainder of their, of their lives. A United Nations survey found that 60% of the world's illiterate are women. This means that these women have limited job prospects, which in turn means they may be forced into early marriage and have a limited understanding of legal issues. In 1985, a commission invest investigating the status of women in Pakistan found that the average woman is born into near slavery, leads a life of drudgery and dies invariably in oblivion. This is the stark reality of half our population simply because they happen to be women. It would be very easy to blame these situations on culture, but I believe that it is the structural policies which the Western world have imposed in developing countries which have allowed this culture to continue. The World Bank and the IMF must change the policies they impose in developing countries. They need to encourage and provide incentives to, to governments to provide free basic education and health care for men and women. In India, where traditionally girls were often kept at home to do household duties, an initiative was taken to provide free school meals. This program saw improved school attendance by girls of 30%. Parents living in poverty need an incentive to, an incentive to send their daughters to school and the availability of a free school meal, meal was a simple and effective method of achieving this. Programs such as Reflect and Stepping Stones, which were initiated by ActionAid, are two effective examples of ways we can challenge and overcome the structural causes of inequality. These programs work at local people, while at the same time challenging governments and policy makers to treat developing countries in a fair manner. I believe that it is only by changing the structural causes of poverty that we can effectively alleviate poverty for women. As I've shown, the policies of agencies such as the IMF and the World Bank are creating a never-ending cycle of deprivation which affects the weakest members of society the most, women. Natural disasters and war always catch the attention of the public, but the structural causes of of inequality and poverty are even more devastating to women. As Raj Patel, a writer and human rights activist stated in 2001, when he was commenting on the trade policies imposed in developing countries, you can make a bomb out of anything. The ones on paper hurt the most. Thank you. Thank you, Aoife, for that, and uh, uh, well, that's a kind of sharp reminder.